This is Emergency FD Storyline. Don't let your cup run over. Because once your cup runs over, you're going to deal with it. You're going to deal with it the right way, or you're going to deal with it like I did the wrong way. I was fortunate enough to come back. My daughter, my friend's wife, saved my life. The fire department saved my life, saved my career. The young guys coming on now, I want to stress to them that it's okay to talk to somebody. A house on fire turns into an active shooter situation, leaving four dead, two injured, including the gunman. Never in a million years would I have thought that somebody was shooting at us. You know, the firemen were good guys. He says, George, somebody's shooting at us. I seen the look in his eye. I knew at that time it clicked in my head what had happened. He had seen the assistant driver behind me get shot, and that's how he knew. One firefighter tells his story of survival and the loss of his fellow firefighters, one who sat next to him and one behind him. Living with the memories and surviving the unthinkable, this is part two of our interview with George Langston. The views expressed on this program are from the guest and the host and do not necessarily represent the views of any government agency, private company, or public service. Emergency FD Storyline's focus is to tell the stories of those in the fire service and to highlight what matters to our first responders. Once again, this podcast is part two of a two-part interview with my guest. I'm your host, Tom Mann. March 8th, 2000. As I mentioned before, it's a date I remember because I was there. It is an emergency scene that stays with me. As a documentarian and a contracted video professional for the fire department, I was there to capture everything on video. And what I saw has never left me. That's why this interview with retired Lieutenant George Langston has special meaning to me. He's walked some roads few have traveled, and he's used his story to help others. This, again, is part two, Surviving the Unthinkable. That's our storyline. There's what we call today an active shooter situation. Yes. You're firefighters. You're there to put out a fire. There's fire in a house. But you're sitting there in, the, in that apparatus... Two members are shot. One of them saying, hey, I think they were getting shot at. You call out for help. So what was the next thing on your mind? We didn't know what to do. I mean, at that time, there wasn't any training, you know, the what we go through now or what we did go through when I was working the active shooter training and things like that. Nobody ran thing in my mind. Said, oh, well, the house is on fire. We know what to do there. So we're here to do something. I mean, when the fire department's called, we're going to do something. That's the only thing that we knew to do. And this wasn't really common anywhere at that time in the United States. Not that incidents hadn't happened. It's not near as common as you hear of things now that that people attacking first responders or police or whatever the case is. For those who, who are listening to this, the man who was sitting next to you has been shot. And then the man that is literally sitting behind you has been shot. Actually, at first, I only knew that Lerma, that's why he was Your down. lieutenant. Yeah, I had, I had, yeah, Lieutenant Lerma. I had no idea that uh, William Blakemore was shot behind me. You say 20, 25 seconds this has happened. You're still in the driver's seat. Yeah, I'm doing communication with the uh, alarm office. And then at that point, sometime during that point, we're getting out, we're, we're helping stretch hose. Like I say, <laughs> our mindset was to do what we were trained to do. That's put out fire. I mean, it, it's not like that we were running down the street or anything like that. We were sent there to put out a fire, and we were going to do it. Looking back now, probably not the smartest thing that we could have done, but we were the good guys, so that was furthest from our mind. 53s come on the scene. They laid wide lines in to attack the fire. This was after the shot, you know, after the assailant was down, not after they had shot him, and they took the plug in the cove. I went down there to help him. I could not stay still. Lots and lots of emotion. 
I could not stay still. So there again, the only thing that I knew to do was what I was trained to do, the firefighting. That was my saving grace right there. Just I mean, let I, me work. I can tell that emotion's still in your face right yeah. now. But how do you, for those on the job now and those who've never been through something like this, obviously you got adrenaline pumping like probably never. You probably weren't even aware how much was going on in your mind. You're doing the job that you know what to do. Yeah. You probably had to even process the fact that the lieutenant that you work with was was gone. That probably hadn't even processed through your mind completely. You and yeah. I mean, you knew another firefighter behind you, sitting behind you, is gone. Another man's been shot out there. The other thing that had happened that everybody didn't know at the time was the gentleman shooting the firefighters had also shot and killed his wife. She was inside the house. There was another engine company that had gone in there and found her. They were dealing with that trauma. They brought someone out, couldn't do anything about that. That, that whole scene, it was like something out of a, just a horrible movie. I'm hearing you telling me this first end stuff, and it's, I cannot imagine what is going through your head. I'll back up a couple of steps. You know, after the initial thing, the fire department, first they put us on a bus, you, you know, just kind of to separate us from the scene. They were doing what was right. Probably the best they could try to do. Yeah, trying. yeah. I'll say this right now, that they were absolutely great to me, and I feel like they did right by every firefighter there. Pretty much brand new, you know. Putting me on that bus is like putting me in a cage. And, yeah. and I mentioned to you before, with the emotions, if you're standing still, they're coming. If I had something in my hands or had a task to do, it was bearable. I got off the bus, and then they moved us around to the backyard of the neighbor, and, you know, they were giving us water or whatever. I don't recall all what was going on there, but they were just trying to keep us together. I escaped from there, basically. I mean, <laughs> nobody gave me permission. I just kind of just walked off because – it was just truly emotional. I didn't know what to do. But I did know that it made me feel good to work. And that's how I cope with it. When, at some point in this time, did it even, a, the thought go through your mind how close you were from dying during that moment, during that time, or did it come later? No, it really come later. I really never thought of that. Toward the end Hours later, I mean, you know, adrenaline and everything is coming back down. The hardest thing I had to deal with was the guilt part. And let's why, tell why, me about why that. Why them and not me? A lot of the guilt part for me, you know, I've heard it called survivor's guilt mm -hmm. or whatever the case is. But a lot of the guilt part for me was the fact that Javier Lerma, Lieutenant Lerma, had two small children. I think his son... At that, his oldest was like six, and his daughter was two. You know, they really didn't know their dad, and I had a hard time with that from that time on. You know, the the guilt part. The one question I want to ask you: the rumors after that, right? You know, there were rumors, and I'm sure that were hurtful. And and if you can tell a little bit about that, because I think it's yeah. something that that needs to be identified. That there are rumors that go around that aren't even true about an incident. Go ahead, right. Uh, you know, there was rumors that the shooter thought that somebody was having an affair, you know, with the wife and everything like that. There was rumors that the guys on the scene ran that. And left the lieutenant there. Yeah, yeah. and that particular rumor is, is not true. Yeah. I can't speak and won't speak of the other rumor. I have no idea, you know. I don't know any of that. I just, uh, anytime an incident happens, you know, there's always rumors, but... Uh, the whole thing about that was is that, you know, rumors are flying around like that. But in my situation, it's like you're on an island because nobody ever spoke of it. They wouldn't ask you, didn't want to ask you or anything like that. This was years later that someone asked me about it, and they just told me, well, this is what I heard. That was kind of rough to hear that people actually thought that somebody ran, which wasn't the case, you know. That's got to be hard. Just the raw emotions, and you said the survivor's guilt. I know you mentioned there's a time that you didn't deal with it very well. Yeah. And this circumstance is so extraordinary because 
it's hard enough when there's a firefighter dies in the line of duty because of a fire. For some reason, firefighters are like, yeah, he did his thing. And that's hard enough. So now you have two firefighters with you that die because somebody shot them. Yeah. Murdered. They murdered were, them. They were murdered. They were murdered. Yeah. yeah. And you survived. So how was it a few years after this? I know you went down some roads. <laughs> and, and the question, here's the other thing. Let's, let's Also, let's give them this, because I want to get into post-traumatic stress. And today, fortunately, the younger guys, it's okay. I think there's a little bit of a change in the culture compared to those days sure. where you talk about it. And they need to know it is okay. This was still back in the day when, I guess, critical incident stress debriefings and things were kind of new. And I think everybody was still learning how to do this. Yes. I mean, you went through something for a while, and then you had a wake-up call. Yeah. This hap- it happened on a Wednesday, March the 8th, and it was on a Wednesday. On Friday, we went down and give our statements to the homicide squad because it was, like I said, it was a murder homicide. After that, we were on four days. So Wednesday, I believe that I returned to work. How do you do that? If you fall off the horse, you get back on, which was the wrong, wrong thing for me to do. But that's what you knew how to do. Yes. That's the way you could cope right now. Yeah. And uh, you, uh, you just you didn't mention it. Yeah. It was that uh, mentality, which was nothing. I mean, that was a sign of the time. So... It was no big deal. I mean, you just dealt with it because that's what we get paid for. Somebody told me with another incident, we're a firefighter. You'll be okay. Yeah. Just deal with it. Yeah. 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 Suck it up. You know, no one ever told me that. It was me saying, you know, me telling myself that the fire department offered help. I refused it. That happened on March the 8th until July the 9th. Just crazy. I mean, mm-hmm. the mindset, come to work, be withdrawn, stay by myself. All the signs, yeah, you know. And uh, I think it was July the 9th or July the 10th, I had a motorcycle accident. It uh, self-inflicted. I mean, I had been uh, drinking, had a motorcycle accident, bummed up a little bit. But at that time, that was the second time in... Uh, 2000 that uh, dodge death. I mean, I very well could have hit something or somebody could have hit me, whatever the case is, but led me to believe that God has a purpose for me because uh, I, <laughs> this cat has used some lives up. <laughs> so, uh, But, th- but I, that, I, that proves kind of the pain, I yes. mean, how deep it was affecting you. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was points and days there that you could be driving down the street and – you're looking at bridge abutments. You're looking at things, and it's going through your mind. Let's just end it now. Yeah. And I know some people probably say, how can that be? Well, okay. Again, you survived. Yeah. And they didn't, right? Yeah. I know we're sitting here 20 years later, and we understand a lot more than we did sure. then. But at the time, I guess it's that feeling you have no right to be here when they're not. Yeah. And you go home and you get to see your daughter yeah. and your wife. You get to go home. He doesn't anymore. You know, that, that that's that's the, you know, that was the rough part for me. Not to take anything away because Blake Moore had, yeah. had children too, but I didn't know him because I had worked with Lieutenant Lerma before, you know, and, and knew him. And we had worked there for several months but I had knew him prior to that so you know we had a relationship a little more than just driver lieutenant I don't know we clicked together we he kind of knew what I was thinking and I knew what he was thinking and we worked well we had a great working relationship that's important on a fire company firefighters know that I mean the better relationship you have a working relationship you have with your guys the better off you're going to be, you know, the better company you'll be. And that's what everybody wants to be is a good company, you know, where they can be thought of as a good company, not just a fire company. There are four guys rolling up on the scene. You know, you've got a good company coming. But the accident 
my motorcycle accident, and it was it was less uh, than a than a week later that my daughter sent me a letter. A friend of mine's wife sent me a letter, and uh, I read them, and that was a turning point. If you don't mind, what what was it in the letters that really struck you? That uh, somebody cared. That was okay. Yeah, because uh, I felt isolated before. But that was a turning point for me, and uh, I uh, sucked it up and changed my, you know, my thinking, my mindset, and uh, turned my attention back to my career, you know, started moving forward and healing. Within just a few years after that, here you are a lieutenant. Yeah, I made made lieutenant uh, in uh, 2013. I'm going to come back to some of this, but I do want to ask this. Did this make a difference when you became lieutenant? Did it make you a better lieutenant, a better officer going through this as you look back now? I think it ha- I think it had a part in it, arriving on scenes and everything like that. I took that extra second or two seconds and kind of just looked around to see what was going on. Where before, uh, it's very easy to get tunnel vision on a fire that you don't see anything, you know, it like a lot of newer firefighters they see that fire and it's a moth to light i mean they're not looking around you know that instance that i was in the shooting i started looking around i mean it wasn't that i was paranoid about it but it was just a little extra step that in your size up that you would look at you know when you got on the scene you did your size up and and that was just part of it it wasn't in the front of my mind it was just something that at that point, it become natural because when I got back, you know, in the department, come back and started work, I mean, I was still a driver. So that mindset was in me then. I started looking around because your lieutenants and, and, and your other people, they were more concentrated on the fire. So I had, a, I had a few more seconds to just kind of look around and see to make sure there wasn't anything, you know, that really stuck out as a driver. Every run thing, I made it, you know, part of, of that as well. You know, I can hear the emotions, see the emotions in your face uh, that others can't see at the moment. Yeah, but that's when good. You, today, now, you've been able to take that, go out, you teach at the training academy, and you were invited to share about this experience, and now you talk to new recruits. Now you take that story. It's probably been part of your healing, I would guess. Absolutely. Absolutely. So tell me that. about that. I was initially asked out to to tell this story. Uh, the battalion chief of, of training had asked me out, and I told the story. I went through a few classes of that, but then I was telling the story with anger because I was I was still just so angry, you know that that the feelings would you know come back even today, twenty years later. But I was so angry, and then. There was a lull time, and then I was asked to come out again. I started the same way, and then I reined myself in. I said, this isn't, this isn't why I come out here, because everybody has war stories. You know, we call them war stories on the fire department. I mean, people's made fatality shootings. What You know, it's we're normally called at the worst time in a person's or person's life. So we see a lot of stuff. Again, pull myself, you know, together and took this in a different direction. And the direction that I take it in today when I do it is the fact of don't let your cup run over. Because once your cup runs over, you're going to deal with it. You're going to deal with it the right way, or you're going to deal with it like I did the wrong way. I was fortunate enough to come back. My daughter, my friend's wife, saved my life. The fire department saved my life when they moved some people around from 55s out to different things. Those things together saved my life, saved my career. I appreciate that from them, and I've told them that. But uh, the young guys coming on now, I want to stress to them that it's okay to talk to somebody. You know, the macho firemen, we're used to seeing everything. And and back then we saw things, but it's not to the, the degree that they see things now. And probably not as much of it back then as we see now, or they see now. I 
can't get over retirement, I still miss it. <laughs> but uh, the the main thing that I tell them is that if you're feeling that way, you get some help. You talk to somebody. The fire department is there for you. Excellent uh, EAP program. Just there's lots of avenues to go to. Go to. That is the thing, you know, that I stress. Uh, I don't. I don't dwell on the shooter himself. You know, we've already made a comment that he was one of us. I do not think he deserves any part in the story other than that part. Uh, I don't mention that out there. I really don't get into the rumor mill much. I just get into the point of the aftermath. I tell the story, but the aftermath, the, the problems that I had almost suicidal point, you know, of it. You know, we hear, here's the yeah. other thing. We hear so many, I mean, I mean, I've heard, I mean, just in the past few weeks, my own son's talked about this to me, the number of firefighters that have taken their own lives. And I don't know, I know there's other complications with it. We don't know, but yeah. you were looking for a way out too. Sure. That's very real. Yeah. You, you were saying you feel alone, you are withdrawn. Yeah, I can't imagine because you're living in an engine house. One of the good things about living in an engine house, I call them the junior high moments, where <laughs> that's part of the relief of oh, yeah. of that of the stress with it are those moments when there's you know the shenanigans and things that go on and the joking and the laughing. It's a daycare for men. It is. <laughs> it, <it's, laughs> it, that's exactly what it is. And and some and, women now too. It, it, yeah. 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 It's, 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 it's a, a daycare. daycare. Let's yeah. just call it a daycare. But normally the women don't act that way. Yeah. So, yeah. but the men, uh, you know, he's looking at me yeah. and he's touching me. Yeah. It's just like a daycare. So, uh, as an officer, I was blessed with having good guys under me and working at a good station and stuff like that. So I didn't have to deal with a lot of that. I mean, we were very busy, which takes away from the he's looking at me yeah. and this. Those type things. And when you get to the point where you can't function even in with that, that's not easing your pain? Yeah. Here's what the public, I don't think they realize. A lot of the public jobs are a nine to five or, a, or you know, 12 hour shifts. So most of the time you're sleeping in your own bed. You're, you know, you're dealing with household things. You're dealing with family. The fire department is a whole different animal. When you're there, even though we've got situations where, you know, we can go out, we can do things, you know, you're in your territory, you, there's things that you can do, but you're there. The only thing that is different from that job than the normal, you know, a public job or, or a civilian job is the fact that you are there so much. Average on like 56 hours a week. So you're there almost as much as you are at home. I mean, probably seeing your family. The thing about that is, is that everyone has problems, but they only seem to come up on the day that you work. We work nine days a month. That's the only time that hot water heaters break, the air conditioning goes out, juniors messing up. That's always the way it was. So then you would get those calls at work. There were uh, situations where the fire uh, fire department would excuse you for, you know, two hours or something. There's something you really need to take care of. But it's very hard on a firefighter themselves is to get that call. That's why a lot of the firefighters' wives are very, very independent because they know where the water shutoff is. They know how to shut off the water. They know how to unplug something. They know how to kick a breaker, whatever, because they have to do it. Uh, unfortunately, they do a lot of the child raising themselves because of the fact of our schedules. The main thing, and I know that that a lot of the people now is that they'll want to try to settle this stuff over the phone. And with that trap feeling that you have there, truly just drive some of them, you know, over the edge. And I tried to tell that to people too. I said, you know, Wait till you get away from there and talk face to face. The on the phone thing, just like the Facebook, people say stuff that they wish they wouldn't have said, but you know, 
it's easier than saying it face to face. So you not only have just just the that personal things that are going on, but then you complicate it with something else. All of a sudden, you're dealing with guilt. Yeah. So then you double that up, and then now you're having to deal with something else that is extraordinary. You know, I've heard so many firefighters talk about, there are things I can't even talk to my wife about. It's not that you're trying to keep it away. It's not really that you're trying to not tell them anything. Uh, Again, this is the reality of your situation. How do you explain sitting in the cab of of a fire engine and people getting shot around you and you live through it, you feel guilty about it, you can't even, how do you explain that? And then you're supposed to live a normal life. Yeah. You, unless, unless there's a fireman that can relate to some extent, you can't, there's things that you don't go home and tell the family. Because the simple fact is, is that they worry enough. If you tell them a lot of the things that go on, that, you know, they would even worry more. And the pain inside with that, that's, yeah. that's hard. And, and, and that's where I try to get with these guys is that so you can't go home and talk to them, but let's talk to somebody that is trained in it. And we have guys, our union has a program set up that guys, you know, you can call them and talk to them. And they have meetings and things like that. If you need to go get something out, you know, you have that. And George, tell them, is it weak if you do that? No. Tell me about that. Is is it showing weakness if you go and you ask for help? No. Stupidly, I didn't and paid for it. But uh, no, it, it absolutely isn't. That is why I tell the story today. It's not to relive it. Because it's hard. I can yeah. tell just talking yeah. about this. Well, I mean, 20 years mm-hmm. and then... You can still, you know, when you talk about it, not that I dwell on it every day, but then when we talk about it or or talk to the class about it, I mean, it all comes rushing back. But that is my main objective now is not to have another firefighter commit suicide. I know there's factors that are outside of the department, but a lot of the factors are because of the department. And I know that we chose the career and there's a certain amount of responsibility that comes with that. But then in turn, we as individuals have to have a, a out, you know. I mean, you have to have a way to get the stress off of you. Because in every job there's stress, and there's ways to do it. It's very important now to, to do that, to, to get the stress off. The fire department's made some, you know, provisions to do that. The union's made strides provisions you know to talk to somebody so it's there we just have to get the mentality going toward that and get the station itself not to ridicule somebody for that you know ptsd is is a lot of that's around the job now as someone told me everyone experiences post-traumatic stress it's when it becomes a disorder you well, know, you know a lot about yeah, it yeah. <laughs> firsthand. Just, yeah. It's been nice to sit down with those who've retired because everybody talks about this now that have retired. Some, some would say it comes rushing back. It's like, I didn't realize how bad the stuff was affecting me. And I miss the job. I can't, oh, yeah. I've, everyone talks about it. Somebody tell me just the other day that, oh man, I would give anything. Whenever I see a fire, I just want to go in there. And so there's parts of this job that is still just burning in them, literally. Yeah. But then the other side of it, I heard, heard them said, you know, I should have talked to somebody. You know, the guilt of somebody dying on them, a patient, or they didn't find a person in a house quick enough. Yeah. Hindsight's twenty twenty. Sure. And it's just like even this situation. Everybody's doing what they're doing. Then somebody's shooting. 24 seconds. 24 seconds. Yeah. Life changes. Yes. Surviving the Unthinkable, part two of our two-part story with Lieutenant George Langston, retired firefighter with the Memphis Fire Department. And just a side note, after leaving the fire department, George became a successful real estate agent, and he's still at it, still serving and helping his community. 
Remember, there are many ways to listen to the Emergency FD Storyline podcast. We are on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Deezer, Podchaser, Podaddict, iHeartRadio, Buzzsprout, and more. And be sure to subscribe and follow to be notified when our next podcast is available. If you would like to contact Emergency FD Storyline with comments or suggest a story or subject for an upcoming podcast, email us at storyline at emergencyfd.com. That's storyline at emergencyfd.com. That's emergencyfd.com. And while you're there, help support the production of this podcast with a donation of any amount. It would be greatly appreciated. I'm Tom Mann, and I want to thank you for listening. There are many stories coming on Emergency FD Storyline. Join us.